maybe it's useful just to take stock of where we are um, on the syllabus. Um, so, uh, so far we spent a fair bit of time talking about physical hydrology. So, so this, by definition, is the mechanism by which the material gets in as a free phase and flows to its location where it's happy to rest because it's held by capillary forces and it's held in, in, uh, in equilibrium and is, is basically static. But once it is static, then it can dissolve and be carried downstream. And so we know this from the things that we've talked about. And I guess the classic picture of what that should look like has been this kind of figure here. And that is that the, the geometry or the architecture of this uh, plume as it sets itself up has some uh, high saturations at depth. Uh, some kind of smear at higher elevations. Uh, if it's uh, denser than water fluid, then it will sink below the water table. And then once it's in this form, the, the rates of flow that occur through this smeared zone are controlled by things like relative permeabilities, uh, as in multi-phase flow, and we understand that. And we should be able to calculate the velocities at which that's done. In fact, you've done that if you're getting back assignment number four now, because I think that was exactly what that was. Uh, but what we're interested in knowing is what is the form of this um, plume that develops downstream. And so that kind of behavior occurs in two broad categories, each of which we'll talk about in this class. Section three is what we'll call conservative transport, uh, which is not uh, in the conservative in the political sense of the word, but it's conservative in the fact that all the stuff that's dissolved in the fluid, the water that's going through the system, is conserved in that fluid. It doesn't get sorbed onto the source, uh, on the, onto the static porous media that's flowing through, uh, and, therefore <clears throat> and therefore is available to get transported downstream. Uh, and non-conservative transport uh, is the converse of that, where a portion of that mass, which is section four, I guess, in this, this class, a portion of that mass is actually stuck onto the static quartz grains that are present within the, the, the aquifer, and therefore are removed from the flow field, and therefore are not so much of a problem downstream, because it, if you're removing mass from the flow field, then what arrives downstream in the water should be lessened in terms of its uh, concentration. And so part three is dealing with conservative transport, and part four is with non-conservative transport. And so uh, in terms of the syllabus, so we're dealing with this part here. And so what I would do today is maybe recap a little bit about what we've done in terms of conservative transport, to put things in perspective, and then finish off with the last segment in talking about how we define some of these particular characteristics, which are the dispersivity of the system, how we might be able to measure that in situ. And so, so that, that's what I planned today. So let's um, go back and just uh, make some brief comments about where we've been in this. Oh, I thought I added a note in here. I guess not. I guess I did now. All right. So, um, this is the behavior that we want. I'm going to make this larger so it fills the screen. And so, um, yeah, so, so I guess in terms of what we've talked about, what we're really talking about is this behavior where we have a, a smeared column. Maybe at the base of that column we have some stuff sitting in pools, and those pools ultimately would be stopped by some capillary barrier and flowing across this we have water flowing downstream which has the effect that it gives this plume which would progress uh, year on year after this I guess this would have to be um, the water table in this particular case be carrying it downstream and so what we might be interested to know is when this stuff arrives and I guess also in what concentration it arrives. So that's, those are the basic 
uh, questions that we are asking. It's important to make this distinction between the fact of multi-phase flow where you have a physical phase or multiple phases that are traveling individually, water and oil separately as liquids, uh, or in the Vedo zone, water, water and air, uh, and the case where we're looking at this transport where the movement of water is occurring within the system and piggybacked on the back of that water is this stuff that's being carried downstream on it advected so so-called advected by the water and so just to to um, re-cement those ideas in our mind uh, what we might do is think about this one geometry that we've already introduced but I don't think it fits I don't think it does any harm to reintroduce it and so this is the geometry that we've talked about before that we have some fluid flowing with some velocity in the system. And based on this, uh, we can look at conditions upstream and downstream. And so the upstream conditions come in two particular forms. And that is if we look at relative concentration, C over C0. And so this would be kind of equivalent, I guess, to looking at a a bucket of fluid which is present within this system which has some initial concentration and this initial concentration runs between 0 and 1 and if we look at um, how we turn this concentration on then we could think about it in terms of this step function so this is if you like this is this upstream boundary condition so initially, there's water flowing through here. Uh, perhaps it's better that I make the water green. So the, the water velocity through here is this green thing. And the contaminant is blue dye. It's uh, ink from your Parker pen. And it starts at some time, T. T0. And you can imagine that if it does that, then as it flows through here, through this core with these particular boundary conditions. Again, concentration, C over C0 between 1 and 0. And location now, so this is now the location downstream. Then if we look at what this plume looks like at any particular time, it would look something, you could imagine it would look something like this. If it's a pulse, it's going through the system. And so this would be time zero here. And this time here, we could get, because we know um, velocity is equal to length over time. And so just by rearranging that, we could get that time is equal to length over velocity, add that to velocity. So this would be time is equal to length travel divided by advective velocity. Important. Advective, right? The actual speed of a, a particle of um, a molecule of water that's going downstream. And so we could imagine that this is the, the case if it's plug flow across the system. And at the downstream uh, location, if we gather the stuff that comes through here, so this now is time versus relative concentration between 1 and 0. Then, uh, or, yeah, okay, well, no one stopped me on this, right? This is wrong, right? This is. A length, right? This is uh, sorry. This is not time. This is actually a length, and so the length would be equal to velocity times time. So just rearranging this, then this 
length would just be equal to the product of advective velocity and time. Time since it was introduced at the upstream location. So I guess this would be this time that goes here, right? And so that's fine so long as it's, it's plug flow, that we could calculate what this distance downstream was and what the breakthrough time is. And you've done this, of course, for, for Long Street. We know that this is not completely true. And uh, the mechanism by which this is not true is that the idea is that if you have flowing from this upstream portion here and you introduce this distribution of concentration C over C0, and I suppose this is y, plus or minus y. Then as it goes downstream to this location here, then if we look at this, we'd expect it to look like this, this Gaussian distribution. And this is either location 0 and location L. So this is some length downstream. And this uh, spreading is because as we go from um, one location to another, that the grains within this portion force the fluid to go on these tortuous flow paths. And if it carries this material from here and spreads it laterally, then no longer does this distribution look like a, a, a very uh, set skyscraper, but it's this kind of spread Gaussian distribution. The peak is less than it is here, and the wings of it <clears throat> are extended to be able to allow this to spread. And so we can characterize this by a relatively straightforward expression, an expression we don't worry too much about, but it's an equation that defines how concentrations downstream will change as a function of two major processes. And these processes are either um, dispersion or advection. And so we can think about these separately. Clearly, this front here is an advective front. It's moved some amount from the upstream location where it's introduced, and it's been carried downstream. If there is no dispersion, then this front will be absolutely sharp and it will be plug flow. And so, in other words, in the case that this dispersion coefficient d is equal to zero, then this is exactly what this front will look like. I think we called it d longitudinal. And specifically, this longitudinal dis dispersion we defined as a function of two components. It's a function of diffusion, which is molecular diffusion, Brownian motion, the same mechanism by which if you put a drop of ink in milk, the milk becomes the same color as the ink over time because it spreads out just by its natural uh, desire to decrease these concentration gradients. In other words, make these concentration gradients go to zero. So that's not drawn very well, it's not stated very well, but D star. Plus some other component, which is equal to an advective velocity multiplied by a dispersion coefficient. So a physical, uh, a physical variable that represents a system. And so these two components represent diffusion, if you like, molecular diffusion, plus what we would call mechanical dispersion. And so mechanical dispersion is just this mixing. So in other words, the dye or the ink that starts here gets split up into two pathways. And so if it does that, then it has to re re reduce its concentration from this location here 
to being spread between these two locations which are on the flanks of this distribution. So that's, that's physically what it is. And so this expression is kind of interesting because if the velocity of flow is zero, then there can be none of this effect, right? Because it's not being mechanically dispersed because it's just stagnant within the pore space. And so the only mechanism that can act is this diffusive spreading by ink moving through static fluid to be able to reduce the, um, the concentration. And if it is moving at some large velocity, then typically this, the magnitude of this effect here is much larger than this, orders of magnitude larger than this, and this one doesn't matter anymore. And so you have these two end member behaviors. In clays, where you want to put things in landfills with clay liners, uh, the flow velocity through the clay liner is really slow, and the only mechanism by which it spreads is by diffusion. Diffusion coefficients are something of the order of, so D star would typically be of the order of 10 to the minus 9 uh, meters squared per second. It's a bit like a, a perme permeability. It's kind of a velocity, right, except it has an extra length involved. And so diffusion rates are very slow, and so they're ideal uh, materials as liners because they don't let the fluid, the contaminants move out through there very quickly. If you look at things which are sands and gravels, then all of a sudden the advective velocity because the permeability is not zero, is now finite, and therefore the advective velocity can be large, and therefore this second term can be big, and it's controlled, it scales with velocity, and it completely swamps this other term, which can't change from this very much. And so you'll get this effect of kind of mechanical spreading as it goes through there. And so uh, the, the important thing to, to note in this is that this dispersive term and diffusive term, they look exactly the same as each other. If you take a drop of uh, ink and put it in a beaker and let it spread over time, then the concentration profile across that drop of ink changes from this to this. It hasn't physically moved, but it's changed in time by spreading out. If you look at spreading due to mechanical effects, then going from upstream to downstream, then you get the same influence. And so you the analog is to think of it that diffusion would be if you have your beaker over here at this location and you drop your ink in at time zero, the concentration profile will look like this. If you physically carry this to this location here, diffusion will allow it to spread and it will look like this, even though it's Brownian motion which is causing the behavior. And so the main point is that these diffusion-like processes, one due to diffusion and one due to mechanical mixing, can be represented in the same term here, this diff diffusive term, and included with the effect of the downstream motion of the beaker as you go downstream. And so that means that this is manifest, that if this is the input into the system, and now if dispersion, instead of being zero, is now finite, then you'd expect this term to look like this, or the front to look like this. So this would be dL greater than zero. And also in terms of arrivals, it would also look like this. This would be dL greater than zero. And I suppose if dL was much bigger than zero, then it would be what would it be? It would be greater, greater than zero, etc. And you'd expect um, this as well, right? Which is interesting because it's saying a strange thing. It's saying that stuff can arrive at some finite concentration before this advective plug has moved through. And so you can rationalize that by thinking that some of the stuff is going through the big pores, but some of the stuff is going through the smaller pores that may have a higher velocity, and so it just arrives by being carried with that way ahead of the, the, the overall front. So that's physically what's going on. And so that's useful to know, uh, and I guess it says that if we are able to solve this equation in some way, 
then we come we can come to look at exactly what these profiles are uh, because we like to be able to know that if we're downstream what it looks like will it rise suddenly as it breaks through will it rise slowly with some premature breakthrough and the later breakthroughs being lower uh, or indeed will this be true um, it turns out that this equation with all of these points going through this central location is, is not quite true uh, and you could probably um, do some inductive reasoning to figure that out uh, by thinking for instance about what if you drop the stuff here upstream and the flow velocity through here was zero you think that that would predict in this way that this uh, flow velocity is zero this length is finite to where you are downstream so if this is zero and this is finite this is infinitely long period of time and so it would never arrive downstream but by diffusion it would move downstream uh, it would diffuse very slowly and so it's probably worth out while our knowing that this breakthrough time for the cent what's sometimes referred to as the center of mass the 50 percent concentration is actually not quite true and so we can always think of it schematically in this way uh, but we should realize that that is not always true so save that thought and we'll go back to it the other way that we could solve this problem is instead of having um, an input here that represents our condition like this so you can imagine that if you have water flowing past this lens that has stuff in it water flows past it it dissolves it and it carries it downstream the next packet of clean water comes in from upstream it dissolves it and it carries it downstream so this is really the, the the boundary condition that we just looked at a continuous concentration of some given magnitude defined by the equilibrium concentration between this dissolving and water. A different um, boundary condition would be if this was a tiny lens and the water coming from upstream is able to completely dissolve that lens so there's nothing left and then carry downstream. And so the boundary condition for that particular case, if I can find it, would look, whoops, that's not it, is it? Where'd it go? Oh, sure. <laughs> so the boundary condition for that would be in time. It looks something like this. And I guess I can make it a bit larger. And so this again would be C over C zero. This would be 1, 0. This would be time. This would be the same material here that does this. But now it does this, and this, and this. And in terms of the behavior along the length of this, sample, this core, I guess, would look like this. This is location. All of these are concentra relative concentration. And the downstream concentrations that we measure at the outflow, again in relative concentration, would actually mimic this. And so these should be the same height as, as these. They're, this, this isn't supposed to be taller than this. Um, but basically, it's, it's mimicking it. And if we add these effects of dispersion not being zero, these would have the same ordinates, I guess, in this, right? This also would be length is equal to advector velocity times time. And in this particular case, time would be equal to length divided by advective velocity. 
if it was true, I guess. And the distribution of these, if it was dispersive, would be something like this. So this is dL uh, greater than 0. And if it's much greater than 0, if we do the same as before, then this would just be really flat. So, And so, in a mechanistic sense, that's what's going on in, in these. And so what we could do is we could always work out where the center of mass of this plume would be. Uh, if we knew something about the time it began uh, and how long since that it had lapsed since we were at current locations. And we could also figure out exactly how long breakthrough would take to occur and in what concentrations it might be. Again, if we choose to, to basically solve this expression. And so last period, um, virtually, uh, you would have looked at two expressions to define each of these behaviors. And those expressions are, just to remind you, um, given by these two behaviors here. One would be, I think we spent a fair bit of time talking about this, these expressions. So the equations of those particular lines for this core, where this is the um, the boundary condition that we apply upstream. It's kind of a complicated expression, but it's easy to, with a, a modern calculator to figure out exactly what it is. And the important thing is that this expression here which defines exactly what it would look like at the downstream location, which is the same as this expression here. So in other words, this expression here, or not expression, this figure here, is exactly what um, we would get from solving this equation for this upstream boundary condition, and it would be the expression that we had um, on the previous page. But you'll note that none of the lines on the solution of that equation actually go through this 50% concentration at the time that it should break through. And so we have to be a little bit careful of this that to know exactly when that would be the case. And so um, if we go back to this expression, this is what they look like. And so we can describe behavior in terms of two parameters. And these two parameters that we describe response in are a so-called Peclé number, whoops, I think with an acute accent on it, as in re, resume, Peclé, uh, resume has two uh, acute accents on the E's. So we call, I think we call this Peclé number, PE, which is the ratio, like all good non-dimensional numbers, it's the ratio of advective flux to diffusive or dis dispersive flux. Which is equal to the advective velocity times the length traveled downstream divided by uh, what we've called d sub l, dispersion. The units of this are length squared over time, length over time times length, so they end up being uh, unitless. And the other property, well, I guess you can see it in this expression here, if I make this go away. This is the equation right above that we're solving. Relative concentration on this axis is a function of two parameters. Just by manipulating this equation, length downstream, advective velocity, time, dispersion, those are the parameters that are real parameters that describe it. If we manipulate it by Peclet number and just rearrange things, we end up with relative concentration as a function of two parameters. Peclet number and this other one is kind of a dimensionless time. 
TR is a dimensionless time, which is the advector velocity times real time in seconds divided by the length it's traveled. And if you think about this advector velocity, um, you could think about this as being um, the length, so what is it? Velocity is equal to length over time. So length traveled is equal to the product of velocity and time. And so if you look at this component here and resubstitute, then when the fluid has gone through from the where you introduced it and has arrived at the downstream end of the core, length L, that's one pore volume. So in other words, TRs can be thought of as pore volumes. So if you put the core, you filled up with a tenth of a pore volume, then you've gone a tenth of the length down the pore. If you filled it up with one pore volume, then the stuff that you introduced initially is now just seeping out of the downstream end. And so the other term that we define behavior is, is in pore volumes, so-called TR, which is equal to advector velocity length traveled, sorry, advector velocity times time <coughs> over length traveled. And so that means that for plug flow, this breakthrough for the case where you have no dispersion, where this magnitude is zero, and therefore the Peclet number will be very large, is this plug flow breakthrough. And as you increasingly increase this magnitude, the Peclet number will become smaller and smaller. And initially, it will tend to go through this 50% point here, but ultimately, as this number becomes uh, very small, um, then it will actually, um, so, sorry, as this number becomes very large compared to the advective velocity, then this number becomes, Peclet number becomes very small, and now instead of crossing here, it doesn't. And so if you plot out this particular relationship here, you end up with a curve and it's exactly the same curve that if you have Fetter's book, it exists in Fetter's book as this curve here. And for our particular boundary conditions that we're looking at, it's this one here. And for Peclet number of 100, if you can see this, then the curve looks physically like this solid line on top. These hashers, I think, are just confusing. I think it's showing the, the span of the, um, the distribution between the, uh, the two different boundary conditions. If you have a Peclet number of 10, then it's this curve here. Oops. Which is this one here. And if it's a Peclet number of 1, then it's this curve on the top. And I guess the main point to notice is that uh, if you draw a line through this 50% mark here, and if you draw a line through this one pore volume here, then you see that the line for a large Peclet number almost physically goes through this, not quite. The one for 10 actually doesn't quite go through it either. And the one for Peclet number of 1, the green one, doesn't go through it at all. In fact, it's, you know, 50%. And so the point is you have to use our simplified, uh, simplistic maybe, uh, way of thinking about these, this behavior that we've drawn in this particular figure. If I can find it. Where we tend to get these going through this point here and this point here, it's not true. It's kind of true, but when you get very slow uh, flow velocities, because the magnitude of the dispersion that we have here ends up being very um, small, um, so this number is where so when dispersion is a very uh, significant effect 
then it moves off this point to look like being displaced through here. So that's the case where dispersion magnitude is small, and it's small because this value completely dominates the behavior. The velocity goes to zero, and this magnitude is very small, and therefore the dispersion magnitude is, is small also. I guess I did this wrong, right? Um, this is for Peclet number equals infinity, and this is for Peclet number goes to zero, ultimately it means. And so we have to be careful about how we use it. So there, there are two examples that we used. One was for this boundary condition, which starts off with the upstream condition, which is this constant um, concentration, which is turned on at time zero and stays on. And the other one is where it depletes and gets carried downstream. And when we use this, we end up with a slightly different relationship. And just to make the case for that, And that relationship is one that basically looks like a, a cloud physically being carried downstream. And so, in other words, it starts off at this location. Uh, if you look at some time later, it's traveled some length, which is equal to the product of velocity times, advective velocity times time to the center of mass. Uh, but it's also spreading out into this kind of bell-shaped curve as you go downstream. And the relationship that describes this is this. Uh, but there are only really two ordinates of this relationship that are particularly important. The first one is uh, that what happens, this is relative to this, the location of the place that, of the advective front. So in other words, this coordinate system moves downstream with the cloud. And so if you look at the center of the cloud, this magnitude here is zero, and this is zero, and this is zero at this point here. And so if you want to get the concentration at the center of this cloud, if you put zeros into this, you end up with a concentration. So if you know the amount of mass that you put into the system in the first place, which is being carried downstream, then you can always calculate exactly what the, the peak concentration would be in the center of this, just from this expression. Uh, and maybe more importantly, you can calculate exactly how far, how wide this has spread just by noting that this distribution is the same as a, a Gaussian distribution, a, a curve if you like, on a test, uh, and that this length, three, three standard deviations, that contains 99.7% of the, the mass underneath this curve, with a small cutoff at either end, is given by three times the square root of two times the dispersion times time. And so if you know how long it's been spreading, if you know what the dispersivity of the aquifer is, you can calculate exactly what this spread should be. Or conversely, if you can measure this in situ, so you have this, and you also know how long it's gone since it was introduced, you could calculate what the dispersion is. So you have two options uh, in doing that. So that probably took more time than I really wanted to do, but it's, it's probably worth time well spent because it actually grounds exactly the things that you've been doing for the last little while on some, some reasonable basis. Whoops. This is it. So those are essentially the two conditions. So we represent the fact that advection and dispersion happen in the aquifer at the same time. We can represent that behavior by a partial differential equation. We can solve it for some boundary conditions. The two particular sets of boundary conditions are for a constant source or a, an ephemeral source, one that uh, gets dissolved out of the system. And the resulting behaviors that we get, we can understand in terms of the physical processes, in terms of advection of a front and dispersion around that front. Uh, for both of these cases. And the simplified cases of the fact that we should get 
a sharp front with all the points going through this 50% concentration is a simplification that isn't really true. It's a, a nice way for us to think about it, but it's not true in all cases. And the cases where it's not true are when the advective velocity is very small and it can't be true because otherwise this um, breakthrough would be an infinite length of time in the future. It would never happen. And we know that's not the case. So that kind of brings us back to where we wanted to, to move from here. So we know that this dispersion coefficient that we've already defined is something that we might want to, to calculate. And so we know that this longitudinal dispersivity is given by two components, a Brownian motion part and a mechanical spreading part. We know that this is equal to the true molecular diffusion multiplied through by some tortuosity factor. Uh, if you look back to 3, 1, we talked about exactly what that would be. But essentially, there are these two components, diffusion plus mechanical mixing. So how could we measure these things? And so there are three ways that we'll talk about to, to do that. And I guess it will turn out that in terms of these, uh, for reasons that we'll talk about, that laboratory approaches don't really do very much for us in many cases. And doing things in situ actually do. And so that will become clear as we, we talk about this. So, mm, yeah, all right. the other thing that we have not talked about today, but we did talk about uh, in the previous sessions, is that in addition to longitudinal dispersion, we also get transverse dispersion. And it's again derived from the magnitude of diffusion. plus the advective velocity times another coefficient, which would be the, the transverse dispersivity. This, if we're looking at a plume uh, in plan view, so if we're looking at a plume as it evolves for flow with advection in some direction, then you could imagine that the plume as it goes downstream might look like this but bigger because it spreads out. Then coefficients which control the spreading in the longitudinal dis direction and those which control spreading in the transverse dispersion are different because of these magnitudes here. And so uh, this magnitude of advective velocity is measured in the direction which the main flow is and so the direction in the perpendicular dimension is zero so this is always the, the longitudinal advective velocity. So not, it's not zero. But the value of this coefficient, which represents the behavior of the porous medium, is different. Maybe this is equal to, maybe alpha t is equal to a third of the longitudinal value. Just because the lateral spreading is less than uh, the spreading in the longitudinal direction. And so the effects of that, if we look at it for uh, stuff spreading out from plumes, and this is the idea here, is that if you had, looking in plan view, at stuff spreading downstream, if you have a big transverse dispersivity, then it will tend to spread out so the plume is wider as it goes downstream instead of being elongate, right? These two will represent these different behaviors. This is where the longitudinal dispersion is large and the transverse is small, the green one. And this is where they're roughly equal to each other. And you could work that out. And so the implications of this uh, lateral dispersion, you could think of it in terms of these field results that are shown here. 
Um, again, for a, a landfill, stuff's leaking out of it. It's getting carried downstream uh, by the bulk motion of the water as it goes from upstream to downstream. As it goes downstream, it'll carry the plume which comes out of this uh, refuse that's here. And depending on the magnitude of the lateral dispersion, you can imagine that the only thing that's different in these cases, uh, if I magnify it, is the longitudinal dispersion is the same in all cases, including the bottom one. But the transverse dispersion is a big amount here, a smaller amount here, and a smaller amount here, and an even smaller amount here. And so what you can think of this as is that basically the top one is something that looks like the red line and the bottom one is something that looks like the green line. You can think of it, it's trying to go downstream. The, uh, the refuse, if you look in plan view, is finite. It doesn't go to infinite lengths out of the page. And so as this stuff goes downstream, if it's able to disperse laterally, then all of a sudden it reduces the concentration that will be present within the middle of the plume. And so that's exactly what you see between these things. Because it can spread laterally quite a lot, then it's quite uh, low concentration in the middle of the plume. And as progressively you stop it from spreading laterally, then it forces it between these two plates to all be concentrated in this plain section that cuts through this landfill. And therefore the magnitude of the concentrations that you get here, which are what these are contours, they're not labeled as contours, but they are contours, are restricted to being in that location. So the magnitudes of these uh, dispersivities, which are a function of the uh, material, seem to be important in measuring them. So how might we measure them? Well, what you could do is you could do this experiment that you see here in the field in the laboratory. And so, in other words, take this with a known value of concentration on the upstream portion. Think of this as a core that stuff is flowing through and you measure the concentration at the downstream location with time and you try and back out of it the magnitude of the dispersion. So in terms of what we've done already, it would be taking a piece of core, it would be applying this, putting ink upstream at time zero, letting it go through at some velocity, measuring the concentration downstream, and then trying to fit this measured concentration value to the theoretical curve for the solution. If it's only diffusion that's occurring in this, then the magnitudes of these will actually conform to a relationship which has a very small velocity in it. And we should be able to fit the, the magnitude of this concentration to a curve where each of these will be for different values of this uh, longitudinal dispersion coefficient. And so in other words, if we find that the data that we have fit on the curve that we have here, then we'd know that this is the actual magnitude of the dispersion coefficient that we have. And if we know that this dispersion coefficient is equal to d star plus alpha l v advective, if we set this number to be a very small number, then the measured value of this dispersion will be actually the diffusion coefficient. And so if we did this kind of experiment where we're really measuring diffusion, it's actually pretty good because all of a sudden it isn't affected by this, this dispersion. If we do it for uh, the case where this velocity is significant uh, so that it's actually representative of this dispersive behavior, it turns out that the result that we get is not very uh, useful to us for reasons that we'll talk about a little bit later. But the bottom line is that we can measure the outlet concentrations as they arrive downstream. We could match it with a type curve for what the solution would tell us. And when one overlies the other, then the value of longitudinal dispersion that represents that curve is the magnitude that we have in, in, in the field. It turns out to be not very good. One of the reasons is that because the sample is relatively small, maybe the size of your fist, then it doesn't really represent the extent of the aquifer where that sample is only a portion of it 
and there might be little lenses that would be fast conductors which would completely change the, uh, the flow field and therefore the dispersion coefficients of it. So an alternative to do that is to do experiments in situ. And so you could imagine that those experiments could be in two different um, modalities. One is with one hole, and the other one is with two boreholes with flow between them. Um, the first one sometimes are called huff and puff tests because you push fluid in and then you withdraw it from the same hole. And the idea is that you inject fluid into this hole, which has some concentration C0. And you can imagine that after different lengths of time that you've injected it, the front of that uh, contaminant, or tracer I guess, not necessarily contaminant, the tracer, would have traveled some distance away from it. And if you drew uh, along this, so this is radius, this is relative concentration, one and zero. So once the, the, the stuff has gone to this location here, you can imagine that the concentration might look a little bit like this, if it was perfect plug flow. If there was dispersion attached to it, then you might imagine that it would look like, whoops, like this. So in other words, this is with D equals zero. This is with D greater than zero. And so this is what it looks like once it's gone in here. And then after you stop pumping in, you do the opposite and you suck it back out. You suck out the water in the mixture. And so as you pull the water in the mixture out, what you'd measure at the borehole would be something that would be a concentration change as a function of time. And this would be C over C0. So you could imagine, if you like, if you look at the time that you take to inject the stuff in in the first place, up to this point, you're injecting at some concentration, and you measure the concentration at the wellbore. It's not very useful to you, because it's just the dead concentration in the wellbore you're measuring. And that's what gets it to this point here, and its distribution within the aquifer looks like this. Now you turn it around and suck it out, what's it going to look like? Well, you're going to suck out the stuff that's in here that's present within the aquifer, so it's going to be 100% concentrated. But this front is slowly going to move backwards here until you get the breakthrough of clean water behind it. So I suppose what it's going to look like in this state is it's going to do something like... This length of time to pump in, pump out at the same velocity, this length of time to take out. It completely pulls the same plug of contaminated tracer out of the system. So this would be the case if the dispersion is equal to zero. But if it has actually dispersed around the front, when you pull it out, I suppose you'd expect to get something that looks like this. And so this would be for the dispersion being uh, greater than zero. And so really the idea, without worrying about what the equation is that defines it, is that it's a bit like this. right? This is physically what it looks like within the core. It just happens to be in radial coordinates pumping away from the wellbore. This is what it looks like in time as you... Um, introduce it. I guess it would be this thing upside down, right? So in other words, in our particular case of the, the well bore, it's going to look like the mirror image of this, right? I think, that we have here. This is the mirror image of that. And then when you pump it back out, then you get this behavior. And so the, what it looks like in space and what it looks like in time are really kind of the same. What it looks like in space, wellbore is here, radially out from the wellbore, it's gone some distance. And what it looks like in time, pumping in, 
and then pumping out. So, so it's a different kind of boundary condition, but you see hopefully the similarities. And so the idea is that if you can link the data points that you get when you pump stuff back out of the system to the, to the solution, then you can come up with the magnitude of the dispersion. And so you could do that in theory. Um, it tends not to be, it tends to be useful because it's actually now accessing a volume which is much bigger than the sample that you have within the laboratory. Um, and therefore it's more representative of your aquifer. Uh, if you wanted to do an even better test, you could do it in something that kind of represents the same conditions as we had before with a core between the upstream and downstream. So you pump into the upstream and you pump into the pump out of the downstream. If you were to do that in terms of uh, an aquifer, then pumping into the uh, yeah, this is it. Pumping into the upstream and pumping out of the downstream instead of out of faces that look like this, they'd be out of two wells, but it'd be very similar. And you could imagine that if you pump along here, the concentration changes as you introduce some tracer upstream to arrive downstream would look a bit like the behaviors that we've talked about along a core. It just happens that this is no longer a uniform flow field where the velocities as you go across the width of the core tend out to be identical. But as you go across the width of the core, you can imagine that this is the fastest flow velocity here because it's between a pressure drop at these two locations which are closest together. And as you go out along these other streamlines, because the length of this streamline is much longer, then the gradient along that streamline, the hydraulic gradient or the pressure gradient is less. And so the velocity along this line would actually be a lower velocity here than it would be here. And as you go out here, it would be an even lower velocity. And of course, this one here is the one that goes infinitely far towards your left and then comes back on the screen as it's gone infinitely far on the other side of eternity back in here. This flow path basically has a zero velocity because it travels an infinite length. But the point is that if you look at the residence time distribution in terms of what the concentration looks like as it arrives downstream, this breakthrough curve, then we can get an equation for it and it would look something like this. Relative concentration, the initial breakthrough occurs on this fastest segment here when you get an arrival here and it keeps on arriving. The next one to arrive would be the slightly longer path here. The next one to arrive would be the even slightly longer path here which represents these individual portions as you go up this curve and ultimately you get a breakthrough curve that looks like this. And so the important point about this kind of behavior and why these tracer tests are not very good is that even if you have no dispersion in your system so that you'd expect that the breakthrough curve might look like this, right? You could imagine that if dl was equal to zero then it should be this breakthrough that occurs here, all of the fluid, all of the tracer comes through at the same time. It doesn't happen in this. Even if there's no dispersion in this, there's some artificial dispersion that is put in the, by the fact that the velocity on the shortest path is higher than the velocity on the longer paths. And so the fact, even if you had a dispersion, no dispersion in the system, you'd get this kind of artificial dispersion which pulls it away from being this vertical breakthrough curve merely by the fact that you have this, I guess you could call it geometric dispersion. Fastest here, slower here, even slower here, really, really slow here. And that's what contributes to this. So that by the time you get to some infinite time, you only just break through with 100% relative concentration because of this ge geometric dispersion. And so if we go through these three different tests, two really, Laboratory approaches aren't very good because it's not a representative sample, because uh, it's not big enough, unless it's for diffusive processes, as in clays, where you'd expect the large-scale structure not to be very important. 
because it actually deals with a much larger volume and therefore is more representative of your reservoir or aquifer. Uh, but in some cases, as this twin well testing isn't very good because you get this artif artificial dispersion which is completely unrelated to the physical dispersion within the system. And so that leaves us with only really one way that we might want to do it, and that is using natural gradient dispersion experiments. And the idea is relatively straightforward. Um, let's see. I have eight minutes to go, so I'll maybe uh, do this in a, a broader way than I, I would do otherwise. So here's the idea. So we have artificial dispersion in this twin well uh, method. So what we could do is we could just look at how a plume develops uh, under its own natural uh, behavior. So this happens to represent an experiment that was done within a very shallow sand aquifer at the Borden experimental site in Ontario. Um, so a contaminant was put in place at time zero, uh, which was uh, just a, a chlorine plume, I think, Cl, Cl minus, within an advective flow field. And after 83 days, and after 462 days, and after 647 days, you go back and you take these little capri tubes, you push them into the aquifer, you take a little sip and put it through a gas chromatograph, and you look at the concentration, and you try and map the concentrations by making it into a pincushion. And so this is what the plume looks like after 85 days, after 462 days, and after 650 days. The one thing we do know is if we look at the migration of fluids from a point source as it goes downstream, is that the size of the plume that we have is equal to three standard deviations, and this is equal to three times the square root of two times the longitudinal dispersion times time from our migrating cloud dispersion example. So if we can measure this by taking this magnitude, so in other words, in this particular case, we have this magnitude here. This is three sigma, and this is three sigma. We have a real scale here, so I don't know how far this is, but this looks like this is about, um, yeah, looks, looks like three sigma is about 10 meters, I would say, right, on each side, approximately. So we have this value. If we know that it's 462 days after it's introduced, so that is um, a year and a third, right? Or, or one and a quarter years, perhaps. We know what T is. And so we should be able to figure out what this is. We know that the length, the, the longitudinal dispersion is equal to Brownian motion plus the longitudinal dispersion times the advective velocity. It's a sandy aquifer, so we can assume that since we know this number is something like 10 to the minus 9 meters squared per second, that's essentially equal to zero. Let's assume that and then check that later, whether, that's, whether it matters that, that, that we've ignored it. If we know that it's traveled, um, velocity is equal to length over time. We know that it's traveled 38 meters in 462 days. Not quite SI units, but we can get a velocity out of this. So we have a velocity. This is the advective velocity. And so the only thing that we have left that we don't know is going to be equal to this. So in other words, we can get this magnitude here. Once we have this, if we assume that this is zero and we know advective velocity, we can calculate this fundamental property of the reservoir. And if we do this, then these are just the steps. For the three different plumes, 
calculate the advective velocities just by doing this. With these advective velocities, we can calculate the dispersion coefficients here, which are these three values here. And if we have these three values of dispersion coefficients, and we assume we know the values of velocities, we can calculate the dispersivities, which I don't think I did here, right? So this is just uh, dx. So this is dx. So in other words, you could. Since you know the, the advective velocity and you know the value of this, you could use this magnitude and you could use this magnitude to calculate what this, this component is here, this fundamental component. And it turns out if you do that, um, the value that you get out of it for an average value is 0 0.19 meters squared per day. I guess not SI units either. It would be if it's in seconds. Um, um, doo -doo 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 -doo. Yes, OK, yeah. So this is what comes out of if, if you do that. It turns out that this is an important way to be able to do this for, for one reason. And so this is the parting shot here. We've said that this value of dispersion, longitudinal dispersion alpha, is a function of the, the aquifer. But if you do what we've just done for this aquifer and calculate what alpha is for a bunch of plumes which have all kinds of different dimensions, little plumes to big plumes. So in other words, you find a big plume that's present somewhere that has a length of 10 kilometers, and you calculate what the dispersion magnitude is that's this point here. And if you go around the world and you calculate it for a whole bunch of different plumes, you get a shotgun blast, which is fit by this curve, which is this value here. And this curve between these bounding lim limits of an upper limit and a, no a lower limit, if you want to take a straight line distribution, it turns out that the value of this alpha L is equal to the length of the plume just divided by 10. That's what this curve is here. It doesn't say anything about whether the plume is in clay or in shale or sandstone or gravel. It's merely a function of the length of the plume. And so one of the reasons that the laboratory experiment to measure the diffusion characteristics of a core is no good is because the value of this apparent parameter which represents our reservoir doesn't seem to be any way related to the reservoir properties at all. It's a function only of how big the core is or how big the plume is. And so that's kind of a conundrum, uh, except the rational reason for it is basically this. And so maybe we'll talk about it a bit next time. But the reason is this. If you think about the spreading in these aquifers being linked to the high velocity conduits in it, then as the plume gets larger, then the chance of being able to catch a feature which has a high velocity zone is much larger than if it's in a small portion of, a, of the reservoir. And so as the plume gets larger, it samples bigger and bigger features which have larger and larger permeabilities. And as a result of that, give you larger and larger spreading, which is just due to the fact that this characteristic behavior um, of the spreading is controlled by this coefficient which as you sample a larger and larger portion of the reservoir, it gets larger and larger. And so for that reason, of these three methods that we talked about getting values of dispersivity, it's only this last one which really gives us reliable values if infection dominates.